Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Rita Ulrich, and I'll be your, your host tonight. I'm a member of the Wild Ones Board of Directors, and I'm also board secretary. I joined Wild Ones seven years ago as a member of the Twin Cities, Minnesota chapter. Our webinar tonight is being hosted on YouTube Live, and you're welcome to use the chat feature during the presentation. But if you would like to hide the chat box, you can enter full screen mode. The links referenced in tonight's presentation can be found in the descriptions below the uh, YouTube screen. We have a series of questions that were submitted during registration that were, we've selected from many to answer during the Q&A session after Eric's presentation. Closed captioning is available and that can be turned on in your settings. The program is being recorded and we will post it on the Wild Ones website and our social media channels. That email, that link will be sent to you by email uh, if you registered for the program and it's also will, will be available on our website. So uh, if you do have any technical problems tonight, please email support at Wild Ones and we've got people ready to help you. For those of you who are new to Wild Ones, we're a membership organization devoted to promoting native plants and sustainable landscaping. We carry out our mission across the nation through educational materials and programs such as this webinar. We have a Wild Ones journal. We have done native plant, native garden designs for several regions around the country. We also have a Seeds for Education grant program. At the local level, Wild Ones chapters offer programs monthly, typically speakers. They some have conferences, most have native plant sales, seed exchanges, and garden tours. We currently have 70 chapters and 22 seedlings in 27 states. The seedlings are people working to form chapters, working up to uh, fulfilling the requirements for charting, chartering. We hope that you take advantage of the chapters if there are any near you and uh, become part of the support and camaraderie that chapters provide. Wild Ones chapters are where members get their hands dirty and we learn by doing. Many of our young seedlings are actively recruiting chapter officers and planning this year's programs. So it's a good time to get involved. And even with established chapters, they often have a wealth of volunteer opportunities and activities that they would love to have your help. You can amplify your impact as part of the native plant movement by sharing your skills and enthusiasm with others. So please reach out to your local chapter and find out how you can be involved. If there isn't a chapter near you, think about starting a seedling. We'll put you in touch with other people who may be interested in your area and help you uh, get, get started in the process. Program like, like tonight's webinar couldn't, just would not be possible while, without general support from many people like you. So please consider donating to Wild Ones. We inspire and empower people and communities across the country to transform landscapes into vibrant and essential habitat for birds, bees, bats, bears, butterflies, and all wildlife, including us. I believe that many people will join us if they know just how fundamental native plants are to address in addressing our most critical environmental issues and if they have the opportunities to learn how. And that's what we do is provide those opportunities. Tonight's presentation with Eric Fusile on native plants for improving soil contamination is the third of our three-part green infrastructure series. The series was developed as a follow-up to Eric's initial presentation in December and um, people ask for more in-depth information, so that's what we're doing. Tonight, uh, he will be going in-depth on improving soil quality and cover a wider range of native, native species and contaminants. And he will talk about the emerging field of phytomining, an exciting new form of phytotechnology where heavy metals are reclaimed from soil for reuse. Eric Fusilli is an environmental scientist at Olson, an engineering and design firm, and he is based out of their Fayetteville, Arkansas office. 
He conducts environmental impact studies and works with civil engineers and landscape designers to minimize the environmental impact of the projects, infrastructure project that they design. His background is in environmental soil and water science. He's a member of the Wild Ones National Board of Directors and he chartered the Wild Ones Ozark chapter and he also serves as their chapter president. Well, let's get started and learn how native plants and phytoremediation can improve soil quality. Eric, can you turn on your video and go live? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, Rita. I appreciate that. Let me uh, share my screen here. All right. Um, sure. Share the right one. All right. How's that looking? You got it. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, and um, appreciate you sharing your experience and, and time with us. And uh, I think you're ready to take it away. Yeah, yeah. Uh, likewise, I really appreciate the uh, opportunity uh, to again come and speak to all of you about uh, topic the two topics that are uh, very dear to my heart: native plants and phytoremediation. Uh, this is just something I really enjoy geeking out on and learning about in my spare time, and uh, apply it in my work uh, and whenever I can, uh, depending on the uh, whatever kind of project we're working on. Um, but yeah, and you know, try to bring this message to the general public just to help, um, you know, broaden our focus. Uh, we as native plant landscapers and gardeners, uh, you know, there's so much more that we could be thinking about when we're deciding uh, which uh, species to place on the landscape. Uh, you know, if we could think about any potential contamination that might be uh, upstream, downstream, uh, you know, or nearby whatever site we're working on. Maybe we have neighbors that are uh, using land management practices that we, uh, you know, really don't prefer or like. Uh, and so we decide to, um, you know, use certain species to help protect the habitats that we're trying to create uh, from these land practices. So uh, this is where, you know, I try to talk about which native plant species we can use to remediate environmental contaminants, which are, you know, there uh, regardless of whether we are aware of them, even in low quantities often. Uh, this uh, topic uh, for today's program, like Rita said, is going to focus on soil contamination. Uh, the other two on stormwater uh, and uh, air, outdoor air quality, uh, can be viewed on the Wild Ones uh, YouTube channel. So with that, let's uh, start on our journey uh, and learn a little bit about soil contamination and how uh, native plants can be useful now when we're trying to improve this. So, you know, why is soil important? Well, soil is a non-renewable resource. Uh, can take over 500 years to create an inch of topsoil. That's a long time, uh, longer than any of us live. So even though, um, you know, soil is constantly being formed, it forms at such a slow rate that uh, if we're not careful about taking care of our soil, uh, about tending to it, making sure that it's of good quality, uh, it will not be replaced within any of our lifetimes. So uh, the importance for soil conservation uh, is very strong. We learned that, uh, especially during the Dust Bowl era, and that's when the United States formed the Soil Conservation Service, which uh, was eventually turned into the Natural Resources Conservation Service. So, because uh, they began to focus uh, beyond soil on water as well. So um, it can also take 300,000 years to accumulate enough substances in a soil to make it fertile. So again, uh, there's different components of soil. You know, there's the mineral component, there's organic matter in the soil, uh, there's the pore space between uh, the mineral and organic matter that, you know, where gases and air is located. Uh, there's soil water, the soil solution. This is where all the nutrients and other whatnot are dissolved uh, in that soil water. Uh, whether it's a uh, soil is saturated, that would mean that all the pore space is filled uh, with water and it can't uh, hold anymore. It's at its what's called uh, its carrying capacity, but uh, sometimes uh, the soil is not saturated and that water is just adhered onto the surface of those soil particles. Um, and it's in that soil solution that plants uh, through their roots uh, take up um, the nutrients that they need to grow uh, and um, do their thing. So uh, taking care of what's in the soil and making sure that it's of good quality is not only important for us, but it's important for the plant, it's important for wildlife and just environmental quality and future generations as well. So phytoremediation, um, this is a plant-based approach to environmental remediation that makes use of the ability of plants to concentrate elements and compounds from the environment and to detoxify various contaminants. So this is the point of many of these uh, 
webinars. So just reintroducing that term, just in case somebody's just now joining in and maybe didn't know what phytoremediation is. So what contaminants are we gonna to discuss today? Uh, well, petroleum products, a little bit of a second part from the issue or the, the first episode where we talked about petroleum contamination, but we're gonna talk about the heavier components. We're gonna talk about polychlorinated biphenyls. These are very persistent uh, uh, organic compounds in the environment uh, and also heavy metals. And we'll probably spend the most of the amount of time on heavy metals. All right, so let's start with petroleum products. We had mentioned uh, in the first uh, episode uh, that the, or the lighter, um, easier to degrade forms of petroleum like gasoline, uh, diesel, uh, those sorts of uh, petroleum products are typically volatilized and they evaporate in time. Uh, but, and so they're you know, a lot easier to remediate soil because uh, a lot of times, even if you did nothing, they would eventually take care of themselves and uh, evaporate into the atmosphere where their uh, concentration would be much less toxic. But then there are these harder to degrade petroleum categories. Uh, they're much heavier, less mobile, and also they tend to bind to soil. So uh, this includes polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, coal tar, crude oil, heating oil. Uh, these are gonna be much more tricky uh, to remediate uh, than the lighter petroleum categories. So sources of heavy petroleum uh, in the environment include spills, leaks, and petroleum ex extraction activities. Uh, here's a photo that I took here um, at a project site in, um, in um, uh, for a previous company that I worked for. And you can see where there is a spill there um, on the soil. Uh, so this is a, an oil field uh, where petroleum is being extracted from, from, the, from the ground there. So got a close-up photo here. So this is a close-up photo of the soil. And you can really see how uh, the soil, the, the petroleum binds to that soil, uh, kind of dries up, uh, sticks to it, and uh, kind of peeling up like these peeling layers uh, from the top of the soil. So since these are harder to degrade, uh, we have to rely on, we have fewer techniques at our disposal in order to um, uh, phytoremediate uh, these types of petroleum categories. So uh, we're looking at uh, phytodegradation and phytostimulation, most, uh, mostly phytostimulation. Uh, and that's where we're really gonna be focusing on using deep rooted grasses and perennial plants. That's where our native warm season grasses are gonna be very, very helpful to us uh, as we um, do this. If you give me one second, I'm gonna pause my mic. Sorry, had somebody come in. Uh, it's kind of distracting there, but it looks like they left. All right, so phytodegradation. This is where pollutants are degraded uh, or degraded and incorporated into the plant tissues and used uh, as nutrients for that plant. So these uh, organic contaminants are completely destroyed uh, with this technique. Uh, when we were selecting species for phytodegradation, Fast growing species uh, that produce high biomass are going to be preferred because uh, they take up and store contaminants faster and in larger amounts than uh, the more average uh, size or average uh, growth rate plant species. Uh, phytostimulation, just to kind of give a little bit of a review, uh, this refers to the breakdown of contaminants in the soil through microbial activity that is enhanced by the presence of the rhizosphere. What is the rhizosphere? Well, that's the area around the root zone. That's the soil um, in the immediate vicinity of the roots and rootlets. So, um, see, I have a slide. Okay, yeah, so the roots uh, ex exude natural components, such as sugars, alcohols, acids, uh, and these contain organic carbon. Uh, this organic carbon, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the acids contain organic carbon. These sugars, alcohols, and acids with organic carbon provide food for soil microorganisms and enhance their activity. So many of these species of microorganisms uh, use uh, petroleum products as their food source. Uh, petroleum, uh, they are hydrocarbons. Uh, they are um, chains with carbon. So they are often food for some, they may be toxic for some organisms, but for some species of microorganisms, they can be used as food. So microorganisms such as yeast, fungi, bacteria can utilize these harmful organic substances as nutrient sources and degrade them into less harmful substances. So when we're employing this technique, there are several different things that we need to consider. 
uh, that we need to consider the root structure of the plant and the depth of those roots. So uh, the roots need to be able to reach the contaminant. So deeper roots to better. Uh, annuals are not going to do so well. Annuals tend to be very uh, shallow rooted. Uh, those roots do not go very deep. Also, the root structure is important. Uh, more fibrous roots are going to be much better at this than roots or plants that have larger roots like tap roots. Um, and that's because these more fibrous root systems, because they have a greater surface area, uh, like take the, the plant in the photo here to the right, uh, there's a greater surface area associated with the, the roots of that plant. And so therefore, there's a greater volume of soil um, beneath the plant that is taken up by that root zone or, or within the plant or the, the below ground portion of that plant. And so... Um, because a greater volume of the soil is taken up by that rhizosphere, you get more micro act, uh, microbial activity occurring uh, in that root zone than you would with a plant that has larger roots that uh, have less surface area and less volume of that soil taken up by those roots. So that's why uh, the native warm season grasses are going to be, uh, or these perennial uh, deep rooted vegetation uh, is going to be ideal uh, for phytostimulation. All plants have the ability to break down uh, petroleum contamination, but some plants are better at it than others. Uh, and, and keep in mind, we're talking about low to moderate levels of contamination. If we're talking about large or uh, high concentrations of contaminants, typically plants aren't going to grow. So uh, that's one thing we need to consider is uh, for these types of projects, we need to, uh, it, these are more suited for uh, low to moderate levels of contamination. Another thing to consider is um, that uh, this can still be an effective phytostimulation can still be um, happening during the winter, uh, depending on where you are in the United States. Here we're on the part of the United States that I'm located in, in Arkansas. Uh, we have a lot of warm days in winter. Uh, so that soil uh, microbial activity uh, starts to pick back up on those warmer days. Uh, however, it does occur at a reduced rate due to the colder temperatures. Uh, this is also a much slower process uh, overall than using phytodegradation. But whereas phytodegradation, uh, the plant is breaking down and completely destroying the contaminant uh, itself, um, with phytostimulation, it's making use of the other organisms in the soil, the microorganisms, uh, to uh, break down uh, these contaminants. So what are some different uh, techniques that we can use uh, for soil that's contaminated with these heavier types of petroleum uh, products? Well, degradation covers uh, using a species such as uh, one of our native warm season grasses uh, as a degradation cover or even a degradation hedge or living fence. Uh, if you uh, say, have a, a, a field, maybe you've purchased some property and you, uh, you know, at some point, you know, people used to uh, pour motor oil uh, along their fence lines to keep um, vegetation or weeds from growing. Uh, that way they wouldn't, especially if it was a fence that was way across their pasture and they knew they weren't going to get out there to weed eat. What happens when you don't maintain a fence line, it ends up getting overgrown with all kinds of undesirable species, like especially Bradford pears. Uh, for instance. Uh, so some people, farmers, especially more so back in the day, would uh, pour motor, motor oil uh, along that fence line. So this could be an option if you wanted to uh, replace that fence or at least grow uh, some of these native warm season grasses uh, to serve as a living fence or degradation hedge. So what are some other things that we need to consider? Uh, well, the excess carbon in soil contaminated with hydrocarbons does upset the ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus. So we want to apply fertilizer to help restore this ratio, uh, and that will help speed up the degradation of those hydrocarbons. Uh, if we wanted to mix in some legumes, uh, like, uh, most legumes are nitrogen fixing species, meaning they can take uh, nitrogen uh, from the atmosphere or from the um, gases in the soil and uh, create um, it, exude it from their roots into the soil in a plant available form. Um, that uh, if we mix that in with our seed mix with the warm season grasses, this could also help speed up the uh, de uh, degradation of the hydrocarbons. All right, so what are some species that are ideal uh, for these heavier components of petroleum? Well, that will include big blue stem, one of our native warm season grasses, uh, shown to be effective against polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Little blue stem. Switchgrass, great for rain gardens. Indian grass, 
Blue Grandma, Budalua gracilis. I like the name of that genus, Budalua. At least that's how I've heard it pronounced. Uh, Side oats grandma, another species of Budalua. Buffalo grass, one of our native stoloniferous grasses. If you uh, live in a dry enough area, uh, especially in the Great Plains region, uh, and you're looking for an alternative to a Bermuda grass lawn, uh, buffalo grass is one of those that uh, it spreads with stolons, just like Bermuda grass. So uh, there has been a lot of success with using this as a lawn substitute in the regions where it grows. It does not grow very well in the part of the country I'm in, uh, northwestern part of Arkansas and the Ozarks, but um, I wish it did. Prairie cord grass. Bottle brush grass. This is one of our native cool season grasses. If, uh, if you've ever seen a bottle brush or know what that is, you can probably tell why they call it bottle brush grass. It's one of our wild rye's, Elimus hystrix. Red fescue, one of our native fescues. And Canada wild rye, Elimus canadensis. Carpet grass favors the, the little, the uh, more Southern regions of the United States, California, Texas, Florida. Western wheatgrass. Eastern gamma grass. And common rush, getting into some uh, species that like lower areas in the landscape. This one's a little bit more of a, a wetland species in most parts of the country. Green bulrush, including these in an area where uh, soil might be moist for longer periods throughout the year would be ideal. Nodding bulrush. Obohead sedge. Common sunflower. This is our native sunflower, Helianthus annuus. Uh, sunflowers were used quite a bit in um, uh, different phytoremediation projects over the years. Uh, I'm not sure when I look at the research, they just mentioned Helianthus annuus. It's hard to know uh, if they're using cultivars or the native straight variety, but this is a photo I took of the common sunflower in Texas. Uh, where it is, as you can see on this map, considered a noxious species, but I think it's beautiful. Coffee weed. Black willow. Sandbar willow. Tussock sedge. Nodding bulrush. Remember, maybe I had that one already. Read these slides. Canada goldenrod, black locust, eastern cottonwood, loblolly pines. This is one of the yellow pines that you see in the southeastern United States. Common hackberry, All right, so what about polychlorinated biphenyls? Well, what are polychlorinated biphenyls? And that's a mouthful. So I'm going to use the acronym that you typically see them referred to as, and those are, that's PCBs. Uh, so with PCBs, uh, since these are pretty hard to degrade, they're pretty persistent in the environment, but there are two techniques that have been found with certain species uh, to be able to degrade these, and that is with phytostimulation, phytodegradation, uh, the same two techniques that we just discussed for the heavier components of uh, or categories of petroleum. Uh, but PCBs were banned in 1979 under the Toxic Substances Control Act. Uh, they do not break down readily once in the environment, and because of that, uh, they are also able to travel long distances. Uh, they were once used as um, a uh, it's basically it's a lubricant that has a low heat transfer so they were used for all sorts of things uh, transformers capacitors uh, oil used in motors and hydraulic systems fluorescent light ballasts uh, adhesives and tapes uh, especially when it comes to electronics uh, there's a lot of old transformers uh, had uh, pcbs in those uh, many of those most of those have been replaced 
uh, but there may still be some out there that have been missed or have not been replaced. Um, but regardless, uh, these things are used uh, in almost anything and everything for so long that it is now. They uh, have found that PCBs are pretty uh, ubiquitous. They've uh, traveled, pretty, you know, pretty much can be found anywhere. Uh, now, here's some other uses. I uh, was looking up here, caulking, waterproofing compounds, pesticide extenders, wood floor finishes, thermal insulation, plasticizers. So there are uh, some modern sources, including pigments used in inks for paper and plastic products. Uh, most of the older electronics that use PCBs um, have been taken out and uh, disposed of, but uh, there could still be uh, some pigments uh, and whatnot in areas where um, these PCBs may still be around. Uh, it's important to note that these are very hard to degrade. Uh, phytoremediation is not a, um, a good technique for a field scale remediation of a site that is heavily contaminated with PCBs. Uh, this is just more of a, um, these species, uh, the more they're on the landscape, eventually, you know, they will, you know, help with uh, the, the low levels of PCBs that are, uh, tend to be pretty ubiquitous um, and help with over time, uh, helping reduce those levels, hopefully. I don't know uh, how long it would take given uh, how much is out there, uh, but um, let's say everything helps. So big blue stem has been shown through research to have that ability to um, can, uh, remediate PCB contamination in soil. Prairie core grass. <coughs> Excuse me. Eastern gamma grass. Canada goldenrod. Stinging nettle. But you never thought that there was a good use for stinging nettle. And you notice on that uh, map there, it shows, uh, it doesn't show it anywhere in Arkansas. And I'm not sure why that is, because I can tell you from experience, it's in Arkansas. Sandbar willow. Staghorn sumac. Osage orange. Silver maple. River birch, red mulberry. All right, so let's get to the heavy metals, the inorganic contaminants. Uh, these are different from the organic contaminants, organic contaminants being, you know, these carbon-based uh, molecules that are made up of more than one different kind of element. Inorganic contaminants, these are basically, you know, an inorganic uh, element that's the periodic table of elements. It's, you can't break them down any further, right? Lead is lead. Um, iron is iron. Uh, so these heavy metals, these are inorganic. Uh, they exist as themselves um, in their own basic form as a uh, element on the periodic table. So because of that, um, you know, we have to rely on um, other types of ways to um, remediate soils contaminated with heavy metals. We can't rely on phytostimulation as much or phytodegradation uh, so much uh, just because, you know, they're not organic molecules. So the uh, um, metals that we're going to be discussing today, uh, you know, have them listed here, cadmium, zinc, copper, lead, chromium, nickel. Uh, I had to re restrict it to these just to uh, due to time constraints, there, of course, are a lot of more metals out there and a lot of uh, other research on different metals uh, and how plant species can be used, native or non-native, to remediate uh, soil contaminated with those metals. Uh, and I won't be speaking as much to waters contaminated with heavy metals. That would be a whole other topic. Uh, so this is uh, just going to focus on uh, terrestrial plants and uh, soil contamination. Uh, so what do we do if we can't break these down? Well, we got to extract them, right? Phyto extraction. This refers to the absorption and uptake by plants of large amounts of heavy metals from the soil and their translocation to the above ground parts. Uh, so after a suitable period, typically what you do uh, is after the plants have pulled up um, these uh, heavy metals and have translocated them into the above ground parts, 
uh, you would have to harvest those plants, especially if they're herbaceous, because after the end of the growing season uh, and that herbaceous above ground portion um, goes dormant, dies, uh, goes back, uh, falls down, then basically you're just pulling those heavy metals up from the soil and depositing them on top where they uh, could be uh, become mobile uh, through uh, wind erosion, soil erosion, water erosion, all kinds of other ways, or uh, be more likely to come into contact with uh, humans. So, or other wildlife or insects. So it's, you know, not good just to take them out of the soil. Then you got to take it off site uh, and, and see either incinerate it or compost it. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit uh, at the very end about uh, a new emerging field uh, called phytomining. But anyway, whenever you uh, incinerate or compost these, uh, the ash or the waste needs to be carefully disposed of. So you need to make sure that you follow our, um, whatever regulations are in place in the state uh, that you're working in. So plants that colonize metalliferous soils, and that's such a fun word, metalliferous, have evolved different physiological mechanisms that enable them to tolerate metal toxicity. And so some of these mechanisms we can actually uh, put to use with helping to clean up some of these areas. Uh, some species are accumulator species. Uh, they've developed these metal transport systems. So. Think about somebody that has accumulated their favorite record albums. They can, uh, they've, you know, got their favorite vinyl records there, and uh, you know, they, you know, basically, you know, have a little stash. Uh, consider each record like a little heavy metal. Then there are the hyper accumulators. These are people that are really into vinyl record collection, uh, collecting. So they have a pretty large collection. Well, getting a little off topic here. Uh, anyway, I'm a vinyl record collector, so you can see I'm getting excited. But anyway, uh, hyper accumulator species are those that have, overde have overdeveloped metal transport systems and are able to concentrate extremely high levels of metals in their tissues. Uh, and we'll go into here in a little bit how they do this. But then there are another class of plants that uh, can live in metalliferous soils. And these are the excluder species. Think of like the minimalist, uh, doesn't have any records, you know, keeps all, all uh, their music on their, you know, the iPod or the phone, it's somewhere on the cloud. Uh, so anyway, these are excluder species that take up low levels of heavy metals, regardless of the concentration levels of those heavy metals in the soil. So they're able to exist in that soil um, and just regardless of whatever it is, um, if it's high, low, medium, uh, they're going to pretty much take up the same amounts, whatever they need. So they only take what they need, much like a minimalist. Very, very basic, doesn't need a whole lot. So things to consider. Uh, if we're going to use these hyper accumulator uh, or uh, species or accumulator species that produce high biomass uh, for phyto extraction. So uh, these are ways to uh, pull out a lot of different types of heavy metals. The hyper accumulators are going to be uh, best for this, uh, but uh, there is uh, research has shown that accumulator species that also produce a lot of biomass are going to uh, be also effective as well. So how does it work? Well, First stage is uh, the dissolution and absorption. The metal must dissolve into a solution that the plant roots can absorb. Um, you know, like I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, plant roots absorb nutrients through the, what's called the soil solution. This is the, the water that has been, uh, has a lot of different uh, mineral and uh, organic matter, nitrogen, all kinds of elements, nutrients, micronutrients, uh, macronutrients dissolved into that water, and it's able to interact with the surface of the root. Chemical reactions occur, and that root's able to take in um, those nutrients and then use it and translocate it to the other parts as it grows. Yeah, and so uh, these metals must be able to dissolve into a solution that the plant root can absorb. Uh, the plant roots must then absorb that solution along with the heavy metal, not filter out that heavy metal. Then uh, chelation and sequestration, this refers to the plant's uh, ability to, this is how it protects itself from metal toxicity. The plant then surrounds that heavy metal um, or bonds it chemically to an organic compound. This protects it and makes that metal more mobile uh, within the plant. So in, in, in some cases, it can also do this uh, before the metal is absorbed by the plant's roots. So that's another essential uh, part of um, this whole thing. 
So this whole process, it has to be uh, protected somehow because plants are very susceptible to metal toxicity. So these hyperaccumulator species and accumulator species have developed these ways to transport these metals uh, to chelate them um, that way they're, or chemically bond them in such a way that they are not uh, gonna be harmed. And then transporting them from the roots to the shoots. Uh, the plant then moves that binded metal to a location where it can be stored safely. And that plant must also adapt to any damage the metal causes during transportation and storage. So the storage of that metal is typically stored in the vacuoles of the plant cells. Uh, the physiological systems that transport and store heavy metals are the most critical uh, in a hyperaccumulator species because heavy metals damage the plants uh, before they are stored. So once they're able to get that um, heavy metal transported to where it's going to store it, um, then, you know, it's um, going to be uh, doing a little bit better. And typically uh, in hyperaccumulator species, these heavy metals are uh, mostly stored in the leaves. And that's an important thing to note uh, because if you have, say, a field scale, a large phytoremediation site with, um, you're trying to, you know, there's some heavy metal contamination maybe uh, from mining or whatever else, uh, and you're trying to remediate this uh, area, then uh, you need to consider uh, herbivory. You don't want uh, deer, other wildlife getting in there and eating these plants because that's going to have uh, a toxic effect on them as well. So typically putting up fences, something like that around there uh, to keep the, the deer and other herbivores out or, or omnivores plant uh, that might eat the plant leaves. So um, that's your restricting access to these areas is important. Now, you know, that's mostly going to be related to these larger scale uh, remediation sites. I mean, um, uh, and we'll go over here a little bit how we can uh, prevent bioavailability of some of these metals as well. So design techniques for phyto extraction. Uh, this includes extraction plots. Like I just mentioned, having a big plot where you're uh, growing uh, plants that are extracting those metals and you go through and you harvest uh, the above ground portions, especially if it's herbaceous species, uh, then you're going to haul it off site and uh, dispose of it somehow, whether that be incinerating, um, composting, whatnot. Uh, this is a great technique for nickel. Uh, nickel, there's been a lot of success, really easy to remediate, really easy to uh, extract nickel from the soil. Uh, it's for, however, for cadmium and zinc, it can be a very slow process. It can be done, but uh, depending on the levels of contamination, this could take a long time, decades, even centuries, um, I, is, is estimated uh, based on the rates that some, you know, they're a little bit harder to get out of the soil. Then there's phytostabilization. What is phytostabilization? This is different than phytoextraction, right? This is using the plants to immobilize those contaminants in the soil through either adsorption onto the roots of a plant or binding that metal to a soil particle in the root zone. Uh, this basically is a goal for long-term stabilization and containment of, the, uh, contamin uh, containment of the pollutant by sequestering it in the soil around the roots and not in the plant tissues. Uh, you need, it's important to note here that this does not remove the contaminant for the site. What it does is it immobilizes it. It stabilizes it and makes it unavailable for entry into the food chain. So plants can also excrete substance that produces a chemical reaction that converts that heavy metal into a less toxic form. Uh, so this is another form of phytostabilization. And so remember, I talked about the different species, the accumulators and hyperaccumulators. Well, this is where our, where our excluder species uh, come in handy. Uh, these are great for phytostabilization uh, pro uh, projects. These minimalists, they don't, they don't need, uh, they need a minimal amount of uh, heavy metals and they're able to ensure that they uh, don't take any more than they need. So stabilization mats, having some sort of uh, vegetation cover uh, is going to be more ideal uh, for a field scale remediation project for the harder to extract heavy metals such as chromium, copper, and lead. Uh, chromium, copper, and lead are all very difficult to extract. Um, zinc and cadmium, this would work for those heavy metals as well. So let's talk about each of the individual metals. Uh, cadmium. Uh, remember, this is a little bit, uh, it, it's difficult, moderately difficult to extract. Uh, we can use uh, phyto extraction for this metal, uh, but we can also use phyto stabilization. Sources of cadmium in the environment, 
uh, can include uh, fertilizer, sewage sludge, uh, especially if you have like biosolids uh, being applied to a field, nickel cadmium batteries, pigment production, uh, plastic stabilizers, metal plating, smelting operations. So if we're going to try to remediate uh, cadmium, like I said, we can use phyto extraction. Uh, this would work for low levels of contamination because uh, when those cadmium concentrations are too high, plant growth is typically going to be inhibited. Uh, and it's hard to phyto remediate uh, something if you can't grow plants, right? Plants are pretty much the uh, centerpiece of a phyto remediation project. So um, you can't have uh, uh, too high levels of cadmium for this to work. That kind of works out in a way just because, you know, it's a slow process as well. Um, like I mentioned, very slow, it can take decades or centuries. Uh, cadmium also has a high bio bioavailability. Uh, so um, if the cadmium levels in the soil are high enough to where it's concerned for wildlife, we can use phyto extraction uh, just to help uh, remove it uh, from the area so that way it doesn't uh, enter the food chain. So that's one beneficial use, even though it takes a, a long time to remediate it completely. Uh, if we're trying to get it out of there, if it's a, a particularly sensitive area for wildlife, uh, then phyto extraction could be uh, useful uh, for cadmium. Now, phytostabilization, uh, this is where uh, we can uh, make use of these large accumulator species that are used for biomass production. And I'm speaking specifically about uh, woody species. These uh, like willows, poplars, these are going to sequester that cadmium into their woody biomass. So uh, willows and poplars, uh, we're growing these species. Uh, and uh, these are accumulators of cadmium. So um, they can be used for phytostabilization in the sense that they are sequestering it. All right, so if we're going to use extraction, and remember this takes a long time uh, to completely extract all the cadmium, uh, but it um, is also uh, could be beneficial in certain situations. Uh, switchgrass is a hyperaccumulator of cadmium. Uh, sunflowers, or uh, Helianthus annuus, is an accumulator. A Jerusalem artichoke is an accumulator. Common yarrow, also an accumulator. Dog fennel is an accumulator. Canadian horseweed, this is like one of those heavy metal rock stars. You see it pop up time and time again with the heavy metals. I mean, it, it seems to be able to extract almost most of the heavy metals I read about. Um, so, I mean, I like to call this the heavy metal rock star because it is just, you know, banging it out, doing such a great job out there, uh, pulling those heavy metals out of the soil. Rattlebush. Fox sedge is accumulator. Deciduous holly, also an accumulator. American holly. Now, this would, you know, accumulate it and potentially sequester it. So this could be also considered a form of phytostabilization. And then black willow, one of our native willows, it's, uh, we can use these for biomass production, uh, sequester it, uh, use it for phytostabilization. And now I'd, I'd like to take a moment to mention that uh, oftentimes the willows and poplars that are used uh, for these projects are hybrids. They will take uh, one of our native willows and hybridize it with a non-native willow, and so it's effectively sterile. Uh, this is beneficial for these projects because, A, um, you know, it's not going to be producing flowers that have any sort of um, attraction for pollinating insects or anything like that. So um, that's uh, one, one of the benefits by, by using some of these hybrids. But um, I believe it's uh, Southern University of New York. Uh, where they're doing research on this and I've uh, talked to some folks up in Minnesota uh, that use these hybrids uh, for um, uh, biomass production and whatnot uh, so um, it is being used. Uh, I don't know how much research has been done uh, on other kinds of willows and poplars that we have growing here in the United States so uh, this section here and uh, for a few of the other heavy metals I mostly uh, just want to bring your awareness to the different willows and poplars that we have here in hopes that somebody will decide to pick this up in an academic or university setting and uh, want to look at um, you know potential other hybrids for other parts of the country. Uh, my understanding with the hybrids coming out of uh, the, the University of New York you know these are going to be mostly used in the eastern United States. 
uh, but we do have other willow and hop, uh, poplar species, so such as black willow, sandbar willow, peach leaf willow, narrow leaf willow, the western species, prairie willow, cooler's willow. Hope I said that right. Balsam poplar, getting into some of our native poplars here. Big tooth aspen. Our aspens are in the poplar genus, quaking aspen. And then here is a cadmium excluder species. So this is another potential uh, to use this uh, for uh, uh, phytostabilization as like a vegetation mat, uh, tufted hair grass. All right, zinc. Uh, sources of zinc in the environment include smelting operations, mining, uh, steel production and galvanization, metal roofing paneling, and including tire dust and debris. Uh, that's another thing is, you know, as we drive our cars around, uh, that rubber does contain zinc and we're shaving off little bits of tire um, as we drive it around on those hard surface roads or gravel roads. And so that tire dust uh, ends up on roadsides and everywhere else and gets blown around. And that is a source of zinc uh, in the environment. So to phytoremediate uh, zinc, uh, phyto extraction, uh, this is used again like cadmium for low levels of contamination because again, like cadmium, when zinc concentrations are too high, plant growth is inhibited. And so phytoremediation is then not an option. Uh, it's again, like cadmium it takes very slow. Uh, it's a very slow process, can take many, many years, decades or centuries. Uh, it also has a high bioavailability. So like cadmium, uh, we could potentially use phyto extraction in situations where um, uh, an ecosystem might be particularly sensitive to those zinc concentrations and we're trying to get them out of there. Also, zinc is a micronutrient for plants. So phytometabolism uh, is another option. This is where the plant takes it up uh, the zinc and you incorporates it into its plant tissue. Uh, it's different than say phytodegradation, which completely destroys a contaminant and typically is applied to a um, organic contaminant. Phyto phytometabolism is where it's uh, not so much destroying it, it is using it. And then again, phytostabilization. Uh, this is where we're using excluder species or large accumulator species um, that can sequester the zinc. Again, Canadian horseweed, that heavy metal rock star. You know, never had so much appreciation for this plant uh, until I found out what it can do with those heavy metals. Uh, and I mean, it's uh, generally considered a noxious species. Uh, There's nothing particularly uh, attractive about it, but uh, you can have a whole new appreciation once you realize that it is in fact a heavy metal rock star. Uh, side oats gramma is an accumulator species. Sunflower, another accumulator species. Eastern gamma grass, an accumulator. And then again, the willows and poplars. Again, um, I, I really want to emphasize uh, that, you know, typically what's used are the hybrid species that are sterile um, and don't, you know, again, you know, produce uh, flowers, pollen, whatnot. And so, uh, but uh, for research, uh, we're trying to stimulate in the interest of hoping to stimulate research uh, using some of the other species around the country. I'd like to go through and just list uh, many of our uh, willow and poplar species that are common to the United States, and it's the same ones. Uh, also, red fescue for zinc, it's a phyto excluder. So red fescue in parts of the country where it grows, such as up in the uh, New England or Western United States could potentially be used uh, as a vegetation um, cover or vegetation mat. Also, California poppies are a, an excluder of zinc. So, again, this could be used um, for phytostabilization. All right, what about copper? What are sources of copper in the environment? Well, this could include wire production, pipe production, electronics, uh, even pesticides. Some of these uh, have copper in those uh, organic contaminants. When they break down, they leave copper uh, in agricultural fields and as well as smelting operations. So again, copper is a micronutrient, just like zinc. So we can use it uh, just like uh, for, with phytometabolism, same way we would, could do with zinc. And then again, uh, phytostabilization. Phytoextraction of copper is moderately difficult, not as uh, very feasible for field scale remediation projects. So, um, but if uh, in places where we want to um, um, 
prevent it from getting out, uh, we could use uh, phyto extraction, but at a um, with the understanding that it's not really going to be uh, remediating it uh, in any anytime soon. But uh, Hell Smart Weed is a hyperaccumulator of copper, uh, little blue stem, and accumulator. And so it can be taking it up and also uh, what it can use, uh, metabolizing it, it is a micronutrient. Big blue stem, side oats, gramma, sunflower, accumulator, fox sedge, an accumulator, false indigo bush, also an accumulator, and uh, black willows. Red fescue is also an excluder of uh, copper, just like zinc. So this would be great for uh, a vegetation cover. Tufted hair grass, uh, we saw as an excluder of cadmium, is also an excluder of copper. Oh, and look back there. All right, lead. Uh, lead is it's in the environment. Of course, it used to be in the ground. Uh, now there's much more of it above ground. Um, Previously, past uses, it was in lead-based paints before it was banned in 1978. It was in lead pipes and plumbing fixtures uh, before they were released. The new ones uh, no longer contain it uh, before after 1986 when that was banned. But, you know, as we are aware, there are still many old buildings and uh, areas and parts of the country that still have lead pipes and plumbing fixtures. Uh, leaded gasoline, um, you know, before 1996 when it was banned, uh, they found that um, roadsides can often be uh, contaminated with lead if there have been, um, they have traffic before the ban on lead and gasoline. We think about uh, vehicles that have, you know, dripping, you know, various uh, gas or diesel or whatnot, and then uh, runoff runs off into the roadside or from a parking lot uh, that lead, you know, stays, it's pretty heavy. It stays pretty uh, immobilized in the soil there. Uh, also, it can volatilize and exhaust. So, vehicle exhaust is another way that it can enter the environment uh, and then settle onto the soil. Uh, traffic cops in New York City uh, were exposed um, to um, breathing in fumes from uh, exhaust from lead gasoline. Uh, current sources include industrial facilities, batteries, and ammunition, uh, lead, lead ammunition, uh, especially uh, shotgun. Uh, they, I mean, it's cheaper. So, there are uh, hunters that still buy the cheaper uh, lead-based uh, shot for the shotgun. They go waterfowl hunting. Uh, they shoot, you know, and then that those lead shots fall down to the wetlands into the water. And then over time, you're going to get some lead contamination eventually um, in the bottom of that wetland. All right. So, again, phyto extraction uh, is uh, difficult for lead, not ideal for a field scale project. Uh, but we can use phytostabilization. Uh, also, uh, something to consider is chelator assisted phytoremediation with lead uh, is uh, a, uh, something that is often done. Uh, lead is not present in a soluble form in soil, so it is not easily absorbed by plant roots. So that's where you can add a chelator uh, to the soil. Uh, one example, one that's commonly used is EDTA. And this, uh, you know, helps chelate it, surrounds it, and makes it, and they uh, combines it into a form uh, that that plant can then um, take up and move throughout uh, the plant. Uh, so this is, increases the accumulation of land, lead and the translocation of that lead from the roots to the shoots. Uh, however, uh, word of warning, uh, well, i got that slide here coming up. First, let's just talk about uh, some hyperaccumulator species of lead I include switchgrass, pale smartweed, Annual ragweed, one you might not have as much appreciation for until you realize that it is a hyperaccumulator of lead. Rough bent grass. Uh, side oats gramma is an accumulator. Fox sedge. Uh, thing to consider uh, with chelator assisted remediation, phytoremediation is this could is an expensive option. Uh, it does cost money, um, not cheap. And to do this with caution, uh, not only are you making it uh, where it's able to mobilize, um, but it will also could easily leach into the, the uh, groundwater, uh, the water table. So it could be that you go back and you test your soil and you realize, oh, the lead's gone. I must have uh, taken it all up in the plants. But really uh, what's happening is it leached down into the groundwater uh, and made your problem worse. Uh, now that lead is 
maybe even migrated off site and um, who knows where it went at that point. Um, I believe there was uh, some studies done with uh, sunflowers where they were uh, trying to remediate lead contaminated soil and that was uh, uh, a mistaken conclusion of that study as they thought that the sunflowers were uh, pulling up the lead but they found out what happened is that the lead actually um, uh, migrated further down uh, into the groundwater and uh, off site from there. It's better to use a lead excluder species as a ground cover uh, for stop phytostabilization. Uh, we can also uh, phytostabilize lead with amendments. Uh, lead is bound by organic matter, iron oxides, and clay, so we can add these to the soil to help bind it up. Phosphite, uh, phosphate reacts with lead to create a new compound that's very unavailable for uptake by plants. Uh, this is uh, just gonna keep it there. You know, as long as you have enough vegetation, you prevent humans, wildlife, anything from coming into contact with it, uh, at least above ground. Uh, so if you can mend the soil with phosphate, limestone, organic matter, sometimes this can uh, help out. Chromium. All right, sources include dyes, paints, leather tanning, automotive industry, and pressure treated lumber. Uh, then again, uh, chromium is very difficult uh, to extract, so phyto extraction is not a feasible option. Uh, here we want to rely on phyto stabilization. Uh, so we're looking at excluder species, and again, uh, tufted hair grass is an excluder of chromium. All right, nickel. Now this is where we have a lot more hope. Uh, sources of nickel include the burning of fossil fuels, battery production, stainless steel production, windblown dust from industrial areas, mining, uh, just a few sources in the environment of nickel. Nickel has high bioavailability, so phyto extraction uh, could be used uh, whenever it presents a danger uh, to entering the food chain uh, from a heavily contaminated site. It's also good because phyto extraction is very easily uh, done with nickel. Uh, some uh, species that are hyper accumulators of nickel include black locust, black willow, red fescue is an excluder of nickel, but also uh, because it's so easily to extract, it can be an efficient technique for field scale remediation products and for phyto mining. What is phyto mining? And this is where I, I get really excited. Well, phyto mining, this is the production of a crop of metal, a metal by growing high biomass plants that accumulate those uh, metal concentrations. So it's like a green alternative to existing environmentally destructive open cast mining practices, uh, holds potential for the extraction of ore bodies that uh, are uneconomic to mine by conventional methods. So when we have a heavily contaminated site, especially if it's nickel or other metals, uh, depending on the metal, I talk a little bit about a few here in a little bit uh, where they found that uh, has been uh, an effective way uh, to extract them. Um, you know, it could be potentially a way to then reclaim uh, these metals, pull them out of the soil from the plants, and then you'd have to harvest those plants. Uh, another term you might see uh, referred to as agro mining. Uh, basically, you're growing plants because of the metals that they extract from the soil, and then you can process those plants to reclaim and reuse those metals. Again, uh, we'd want to use hyperaccumulator and accumulator species. Uh, much of the research that I've seen done uh, has been uh, using non-native species. I haven't been able to find uh, successful research with native species, but it seems like brassica genus, uh, the, well, uh, the mustards, um, or is it the brassica family? Uh, but usually typically like Indian mustard, um, uh, not, not, the, uh, not a native mustard, native to Asia, I would imagine. Um, uh, has been used and has been very successful with phyto mining of nickel. But I do just, uh, just in the hopes of stimulating uh, some, maybe some academic research on some of our native hyperaccumulator species that we have here that are known to pull up lots of nickel. Uh, perhaps uh, there is some uh, potential here for using some of these uh, for phyto mining of nickel. So um, I'm just going to list some hyperaccumulators of nickel. Keep in mind, these can also be used for general phyto extraction as well. So balsam groundsel, one of our Pacara species. Again, that heavy metal rock star, Canadian horseweed. Keeps popping back up. Sunflower. Dog fennel. Accumulator. 
So phyto mining techniques, this is, uh, you know, we can, you know, in addition to the uh, reliance solely on the plants, uh, the uptake of metals can also be induced with a chelator, another agent. You can add that to the soil, increase that metal solubility or mobilization so that the plant can absorb it more easily. Uh, like I said, we need to see more research in this. Uh, it's kind of a, a new field. Um, I have seen some research that has uh, proves to be hopeful for uh, iron, uh, as well as some of our what we call noble metals like silver, gold, platinum, uh, you know, ir iridium, rhodium, uh, thallium. Uh, but, you know, wouldn't it be nice to be able to mine gold instead of having to go dig it out of the ground? So, I mean, mining as in uh, agro mining or phyto mining, so something to think about. And with that, I'll conclude my presentation and take the questions that were selected. Well, thank you so much, Eric. I feel like I really um, it should have majored in chemistry, but <laughs> honestly, I sucked at it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest, it was challenging for me too. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's not easy. It takes a special person to be really good at chemistry. I, I, I think absolutely. Uh, my dad was a chemical engineer, worked on adhesives, by the way. Oh. But uh, it didn't rub off on me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thanks for that. Before we start the Q&A, I just want to let people know that there is a link to our survey, uh, and we do want you to fill that out. After tonight's presentation, your feedback helps us keep improving, and um, we also will email that to everyone who registered for the event. So I'm looking at my questions here, and one thing we could start with, Eric, is a question. How do I know if my soil um, in my yard is contaminated? Right. And that's um, a lot of times uh, you'll need to go to an environmental testing lab, provide a sample, uh, would cost you money. Um, you know, and, you know, there are universities that do typical soil testing. Uh, you know, many states have these, uh, but they typically are only going to tell you your, you know, levels of nutrients, uh, pH, you know, more of what you need to know for growing a garden or crops or whatnot. If you're looking for actual contaminants, break down what's in that soil. If you go to Google and, you know, type in environmental testing lab near me, uh, there, there are often these labs around. And some universities will also test for contaminants as well. Uh, just kind of look up your, your nearest university and see if they have a soil or water lab or they provide that service. Uh, here, the University of Arkansas uh, takes uh, soil and water samples, or at least water samples, I know, uh, to test for various uh, contaminants, but it does, it does cost a fee. But environmental testing lab are typically what we rely on uh, if we uh, are doing uh, a remediation project or if we're doing what's called a phase one or two environmental site assessment where we're, we you know, know there's some contamination and we're trying to figure out how far has that contamination spread, we got to go out and take uh, soil samples and see um, you know, how far has it gone. Or if we're looking at groundwater, they got to take samples down there, but and then we send those off to a, a local uh, environmental testing lab and they, they give us the results. Right. So there's no easy way or inexpensive way to do this. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay. A lot of people have concerns about uh, safety and contaminated soil. So several questions talked about what effect contamination has on growing food and um, even native plants that um, are used in conjunction with gardens and farming, sometimes for the pollinator um, uh, services. Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, especially with heavy metals, I mean, growing food, depending on the type of food, uh, could be an issue. Um, you know, you know, biosolids um, is one way that uh, 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 that some cities uh, manage their their waste uh, from the wastewater treatment plants. You know, they basically you know take a lot of the waste and you know it's dried out, and then you, you typically you'll need like to apply it somewhere to like a field. 
Uh, but they've looked into, you know, if you're applying it to a field that's used for agricultural purposes, it's going to depend a lot on uh, what you're growing there. If you're growing potatoes or root plants, things like that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to be uh, so great. Um, there are different regulations. If you go into the EPA's website on uh, when and how much of these biosolids can be applied to these agricultural fields, depending on the crop that's being grown for food. So uh, different plants will accumulate different, you know, parts and different uh, parts of the plant. So if you're not, uh, if you're basically harvesting the above, you know, parts of the above ground part, um, there are ways that it can be applied uh, certain levels, certain timing of the year, that sort of thing that can make that safe agriculturally. Um, that's, um, yeah, I just remember I did a big report on that when I was in school uh, for one of my projects and just got really deep into <laughs> Uh, all of that. But uh, another thing to consider is uh, foragers, you know, you know, myself and a lot of people around the country are foraging wild plants. Um, and it's not our grandparents environment, or not our great grandparents environment anymore. Uh, that was, you know, much more safe, you know, several hundred years ago. Uh, now, um, we brought a lot of elements from deep within the earth to the surface. And so we use them in all kinds of ways and they get spread around and put on top of the surface of the earth uh, in various places. Uh, so I think it's important if you're foraging root plants or uh, from certain areas to be aware of where are you foraging from, uh, you know, cattails from an isolated pond, you know, with nothing upstream or uphill or anything like that, you know, out in the country, it's probably going to be safe compared to cattails um, in an urban stream or urban area or downstream of a large metropolitan area. Uh, it's my, probably going to be more likely to have lead uh, in those roots and tubers. So um, just uh, something to consider. Goldenrod, another one that um, people make tea with the leaves uh, for you know, it can be used as a diuretic, help with urinary tract infections, all kinds of things. It's also a hyperaccumulator of lead, and those lead, that lead does accumulate in those leaves. So depending on where you're collecting goldenrod from, it could be, um, you know, potentially contaminated. Wow. <laughs> it's kind of scary. Yeah, I mean, they looked at just black tea that's on the market and have found that a lot of black teas have um, levels of uh, metals in them. I mean, it's just... It's a different world. It's, yeah, yeah. I'm going to say it again. That's scary. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think it's, you know, low enough that we're, it's not easily detected. It's not obvious, but you can think about what persistent exposure might do over our, our lifetimes. Precisely. Yeah. And, and there was a question about foraging and, and how to consider what's safe. Um, and they, they reference things like an irrigation ditch. Um, but um, to what degree do um, contaminants get into um, fruit, berries, the flowers and berries? Um, yeah, how? they they can. Um, you know, heavy metals, now I was looking into this um, just recently, because I've been really curious, like what impact might this have on insects and insect populations? Or if you have a field scale remediation site, uh, what impact might that have on insects? And yep, yeah, uh, nectar, uh, the metals can, uh, levels can be high in nectar. Uh, one study I found was hopeful. Uh, it looked at um, different pollen data the control group and a group where they were in, uh, intentionally and, in, you know, putting more metals into that nectar, uh, treating the plant in such a way that it, the nectar uh, metal contents were high. And they found that insects, um, while they would visit those flowers with the high levels of metals in the nectar, I uh, didn't spend much time there. Uh, they didn't, they seemed to be able to like, Oh, this doesn't taste good. <laughs> you know? And so they weren't uh, taking that nectar as much uh, from those flowers. So it seemed, seemed to have a negative response uh, in a good way. When I say negative response, meaning that they didn't prefer those. Now, the flip side of that is, you know, is that making flowers all over just less desirable, depending on where you are in an urban area, they might just have no other choice. So while they may not prefer it, you know, uh, they could still be getting those, but it could have impacts on insect populations. Um, I've read studies where they were looking at lead uh, entering into beehives, uh, honey beehives, uh, and um, through the lead that was in uh, the nectar uh, and the flowers, uh, the honeybees were uh, harvesting 
you know, nectar and pollen from. So, right. and how that, you know, might have an impact on uh, honey, um, the honey market. So, I mean, I know honeybees are, you know, you could argue are not great for our native bees or native pollinators, you know, but something else it just goes to show that these metals can end up uh, other parts of the environment um, that way as well. And even in our yeah. foods. Yeah. And that's, that was another area that, uh, that where you, uh, once it gets into insects, you know, it's going to move up the food chain and, and presumably accumulate as well. Right. And, you know, I think that's really where, when it comes to heavy metals, uh, you know, trying to stabilize it to prevent it from entering the food chain is going to be a better option and using excluder species in areas where, you know, that, that contamination might be a little high. Um, and there's probably research out there, you know, tried to do some searching for some native species. I mean, there's a list, all kinds of lists of species of excluder species, you know, but I tend to focus on the natives. Um, and so, you know, I included the ones that I was able to identify in this talk, but I'm always looking for more. So that's definitely, I think, something that we need to focus on. Right. Do you know anything about um, contamination, um, PFAs? I, I don't know so much about that. Uh, I know that there, I've seen literature out there about it. I haven't taken the dive into that contaminant uh, at this point. So okay. yeah, I'm not really able to talk a whole lot about PFAs. A, a really good question on the um, phyto mining is uh, what time frame is associated with phyto remediation and who's carrying out the recovery of heavy metals um, and is it potentially income generating for a heavily polluted site yeah it can be depending on the metal um, like i said they've had the most success with nickel because um, i mean not only do you have to be able to extract it like i mentioned some metals are very difficult to extract some of them are much easier uh, so the much easier ones you're going to have a lot easier time getting but you also have to be able to extract enough to make it economically viable so that's the other thing so that's you know we're nickel like combined with certain species like indian mustard uh, and other brassicas uh, has shown to you know have some economic viability uh, then as far as disposing of it um, you know i think you know i imagine you have some sort of contractor that's you know working with that that's you know able to do all that uh, i've never had the luxury or opportunity to be part of a phyto mining project but uh uh, one of my coworkers here at Olson has. So, uh, but I think he said he was on more involved on the front end uh, with getting the plants established and didn't get to see the final result. Okay. Some, uh, there are a couple questions about uh, pesticides in runoff and also aerosolizing and then dropping, but um, particularly Roundup uh, was mentioned. Yeah. And, you know, my understanding of Roundup is that it's not soil active, um, you know, when it's sprayed onto a plant on, you know, the above ground portion, you know, it, it kills that plant. Uh, once it's in the soil, it's not uh, harmful to the, the soil organisms. Um, also, my understanding is it breaks down pretty quickly. And so uh, in an area where it's been used, um, you know, it, you know, that, it, you know, it, you know, has a, you know, short half-life comparably or relatively, um, you know, very different from many of the pesticides that we used, you know, before Rachel Carson's Silent Spring that were much more persistent in the environment. Um, so, I mean, my understanding with Roundup is if you spray it in a garden area where you're going to be growing food, uh, you can typically be growing there that same year uh, if you plant within several weeks and it's, it's going to be pretty safe. Okay. Uh, this question I thought was kind of interesting. Is there any research that you know of on the impact of artificial turf uh, on surrounding soils? Um, yeah, that is interesting. You know, um, I'd have to see what those are made of. I'd imagine some sort of polymer of some kind. Um, far as what they are leaching you know i mean um i don't know if they contribute microplastics you hear about and they just recently discovered microplastics in human blood you know this is a a new contaminant we're going to, have to deal with you know what what impact is that going to have on our hormones you know um so i mean it's just um 
And again, it's not our grandparents' world anymore. <laughs> you know, it really we, isn't. <laughs> and we, we don't know what we're doing until often it's too late, you know. Um, like yeah, with PCBs and, and asbestos was like a miracle substance, right? For what it was used for until we realized, so, and, you know, the issues it was causing. Same with PCBs, it's great, a lubricant with low heat transfer. This is awesome. You know, let's put it in all of our electronics and stuff, you know. And then we realized, oh, wait a minute, no, um, wasn't such a great idea. There are all there's these, you know, bad side effects that we're now, you know, having to deal with. I, I think we have a long history of being a little too quick. <laughs> Yep. On some things because um yeah there are always side effects uh of there are. one kind or another and and uh so thinking about what they might be and and doing the research but but yeah we we like to get things out there fast on the market right yeah it's like they try to have that balance between well how much research is enough how much is not enough um you know, how much you could spend tons of money on research to where by the time you're done, you lost so much money on that. Then by selling the product, you're not going to make that up. So it's just a balance there. Um, and, you know, I'm glad there are certain rules in place before products can enter the market that they have to look into it. But then, you know, I think there's continued research that's still needed uh, to make sure that those unintended side effects aren't occurring. You know, whenever as a society we adopted the automobile, uh, we probably at that time didn't realize that we'd be, you know, losing thousands of people to these things every year. You know, how many people die in car crashes? That's just, a, uh, you know, an unintended side effect that we just live with. True, true. Um, there were a couple questions that ask about pollinators and, and other insects that are on plants that might be absorbing. And uh, now you did mention that they may not like the... Uh, According to the one study, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's obviously very nascent, uh, the research on this, and, and much more needs to be done. So yeah. we'd very much like to see it. I have to completely agree with, with that. Uh, take and, because the potential is is very promising mm -hmm. yeah i agree i mean you know i don't know how much of it is this i haven't found the research yet because i'm just you know very recently within the last several months um or year have been looking into that but you know only when i have time here and there mm -hmm. uh so you know, if, if anyone is aware of research, uh, please send it. Uh, that's definitely something I want to know more about. Uh, but if the research isn't quite there yet, then uh, it's definitely an area, I think, too, that you know, needs to be looked into. Right. Well, do you want me to throw any more of these at you? Uh, one one question talked about arsenic. I don't think. Really yeah, and that one is more going to be, um, you see that a lot more in water, you know, groundwater. Contamination. I remember, oh, maybe 10 years ago, there was concern with arsenic and rice fields um, and rice absorbing arsenic and then our, our rice on market uh, having high arsenic levels, um, you know, and that's supposedly my understanding when talking with some folks at our local uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service office, that that's been an ongoing issue is arsenic and rice. So, um yeah, and yeah, I think my understanding with arsenic is it's more mobile in water, uh, and it's more of a groundwater issue. So I didn't really con uh, include it here in the soil talk. Yeah, uh, like selenium uh, is another one you see it. You know, it bioaccumulates in fish. Uh, so you know, one thing that environmental consulting firms do is they go do selenium surveys of fish and take out tissue, take tissue samples and, you know, test for those levels to see if the selenium levels in that stream are high, you know, um, or if they're within the levels that are, you know, good for aquatic ecosystems. Right. Yeah. I mean, obviously a certain amount of, of these is naturally occurring without having been artificially introduced. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, one person, uh, said that he had soil tested with high aluminum and he yeah. is bad but is there something you can plant to remove aluminum from the soil that's a really good question you know and this kind of leads into another thing is 
you know, with aluminum soil, uh, <clears throat> you can get a, a, an effect called aluminum hydrolysis, and that is where uh, the aluminum and the water, the H2O, has a reaction uh, to where it uh, has a chemical reaction to where a byproduct that is uh, these free hydrogen atoms. And so that will drop the pH of a soil uh, pretty quickly through that aluminum hydrolysis uh, reaction. Um, and so um, pH uh, of aluminum contaminated soils tends to be much lower. Uh, but then that kind of leads into another thing where um, a lot of these different metals and nutrients, especially the metals that are nutrients, macro and micronutrients, are typically only plant available within certain pH ranges. So uh, that's another way uh, <clears throat> that you could look at <clears throat> potentially preventing some of these um, metals from getting into plants is by controlling the pH of that soil. Um, so keeping it at a level to where plants aren't going to, it's not going to be available to the plants. Uh, but then, you know, that might not be ideal for a garden setting where you want the soil at a certain pH to grow, <laughs> you know, vegetables. Right. Um, but yeah, it was something that's going to take up a lot of aluminum. I mean, there probably is, um, uh, I didn't, um, I don't know if I see iron and aluminum or two that I haven't really started compiling a list yet. Mm -hmm. I've been focusing on some of those other metals, but yeah, that's interesting. Um, uh, yeah, I would like to learn more in about which plants might be pulling those up or how easy it is to extract aluminum or if it's better to try to stabilize it. Yeah. Well, and speaking of uh, a question on creosote that um, uh, a community that lives close to what used to be the largest creosote plant in the country um, for most of the 20th century, and the EPA cleaned it up and said it's clean, but the neighbors aren't particularly satisfied and they want their yards tested more. But the question boils down to um, what could be planted to help remove those toxins? And I think that's where you're going to look at uh, phytostimulation uh, and uh, deep-rooted fibrous root systems, native warm season grasses, the big four, especially big blue stem, little blue stem, um, Indian grass, and uh, switchgrass <clears throat> are going to be really good, helpful. Good. Thanks. And just checking... Oh yes, the, another situation was a buried oil tank that because the tank had been removed, but it had been very old and um, had disintegrated. So clearly there was some leakage. Mm -hmm. And they said the soil assessment was good, but this spring um, grass and the plantings in that area all died. So he's looking for the best way to potentially heal that. Um, yeah. Well, that um, says sending new plant soldiers to an untimely death. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. It's just heartening when you plant something and it just, you know, um, they don't do well. Plants are people too, you know. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, I feel that way. Uh, we're starting to learn in science more and more, you know, uh, that, you know, communication and intelligence isn't just limited to humans or animals, you know, that, you know, other life forms seem to have it as well. But um, yeah, with, without knowing what was in that tank, uh, it's hard to give some recommendations. Uh, you, know, if, you know, that happens a lot with underground storage tanks. They corrode over time. And so you see this a lot with older gas stations. Right. You know, uh, they have to replace those tanks after 30 to 50 years. Um, and so it's um, not an uncommon thing. So it's, it just depends on what was in it, A. Um, without knowing the site conditions, uh, to know, you know, what other factors may be involved, but also just, um, you know, you could pay for, uh, take a soil sample and try to get it tested in an environmental testing lab and, you know, see what um, may be in that soil uh, could shed some light on what the issue is. Yeah. If people are interested in pursuing, well, first of all, specific information for their situations, mm -hmm. um, where should they be looking? Oh, that's a good question. This is because it's such a, there's all kinds of books out there and what native plants we should choose for, you know, pollinators. And there's the, all the, most of the literature on phytoremediation is academic. Uh, I will tell you a really great book. I highly recommend. Um, this is just for landscape divine. I don't know if you could see this. Um, is, am I showing that? I don't see my yeah, screen. Uh, let your 
pull it back a little bit because and, and give your camera time, okay. to, time to focus. Uh, my hand here. There we go. <laughs> Is it doing it? It's Fido is the name of it. You better read it for us. Yeah. Okay. Fido, Principles and Resources for Site Remediation and Landscape Design. Uh, this book contains a lot of non-native species, but it contains some native species in here as well. But it's really great. Uh, I keep it at my desk and it's got all kinds of great uh, ideas for how we can uh, use fighter remediation and just simple landscape uh, design, uh, you know, in our urban environment, suburban environments as well. Oh, there we go. If I move it. Almost. <laughs> there we go. That helps. We got a glimpse there. Okay. Uh, maybe we can put that up on the website, but... I mean, all the other literature I have, uh, you know, is published by Springer, Taylor and Francis. I mean, there's the International Society for Fighter Remediation. They have a great uh, journal that they publish. Um, yeah, I don't know that there's much else out there that's not an academic form. Right. So um, you, have, you have to be persistent to find those academic studies now. It seems to take longer than it used to. Right. And I've been writing articles uh, for um, the Colorado Native Plant Society the, um, for, uh, the, for wild ones in our journal, uh, doing a series of articles on the big four and how they can be used for various contaminants. So uh, hopefully uh, this will, you know, help put out some information, written some articles for the Arkansas Native Plant Society on species in Arkansas. Uh, you know, that's just in our newsletter and you can find these on the, the websites for these organizations um, and, yeah, I haven't uh, started writing a actual book yet, but uh, it's in the back of my head. I, I don't know if I'll ever do that or not, but I just think that there needs to be a resource out there uh, for just a simple landscaper, home gardener, or landscape architect even um, that focuses specifically on native plants uh, and fighter remediation. Right. And there's probably more knowledgeable people to do that than myself, uh, you know, to, to write a book like that. Any final words of advice, encouragement, wisdom for us? Um, that, you know, uh, I think uh, it's, it's hopeful, you know, we have all these people that are, you know, becoming more aware, you know, if we can see how much awareness has grown over the plight of pollinators and wildlife like monarchs and all the efforts that are being made to uh, help with that. Um, you know, I think uh, as, you know, native plant uh, gardening and landscaping enthusiasts, you know, it's, you know, in time, my hope is that we'll be just as knowledgeable as a group about which plants are good for which contaminants as we are about which plants are host plants for specific, you know, caterpillars. So uh, right. just, it takes time. Or at least know. be able to look it up. Easily. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Now there is a great website. I do want to refer people to uh, Stevie Fumilari. I'm assuming that's how you say that. She has a great database uh, on our website, but if you go to S-T-E-V-I-E, uh, sorry, S-T-E-V-I-E, Stevie, uh, F-A-M-U-L-A-R-I, Fumilari, that's her name, dot net, uh, then you, then slash fighter remediation, she has a online database, and again, it's a collection of native and non-native species, but you can look through this database um, and look at uh, by the contaminant um, or by the species. And, and for some of these plants, she has a picture of it. Others, um, and almost all of them, well, let's say all of them actually have the academic uh, reference or publication uh, that um, where you can look more into uh, the studies that were conducted with that species and that and a particular contaminant and for many of them she also mentions uh the the technique or different uh ways that they can be used um kansas state university also had a has a really great database uh, and access uh microsoft access type database i uh, went to the website recently and for some reason it wasn't on there any longer uh, but you know, I, I do have a copy of that uh, database and you can look uh, plants and, uh, can, you know, look, you know, search things by either plant or contaminant. And that was developed by the researchers at KSU. Uh, so, you know, th there's information out there on the web. It's just, uh, you know, not, you, you got to find it. Right. Well, thanks so much, Eric. Uh, yeah, thank you. Away once again, by your knowledge and, not just the, the breadth, but also the depth. And I appreciate share, you're sharing that with 
wild ones and anyone else who is interested and um thank you i appreciate the opportunity and appreciate people listening to me ramble so <laughs> okay well that's going to wrap it up for us folks thanks for watching and have a great evening <laughs>